in the 80s when I was doing video, or especially in my early days of learning video, the first computers I had access to were specific, as opposed to today where the machine can be virtually anything. At that time, we had a lot of dedicated processors. So the dedicated processor, for example, was like a CMX editor, you know, the computer mm -hmm. editing system for videotape editing, CMX editor, and then other specialized processors like a digital effects device like a, a DVE mm -hmm. or a Quantel, SqueezeZoom, mm -hmm. ADO, then Kaleidoscope, uh, Quantel Paintbox, things like this. So I was using computer much more as a method of controlling media in terms of media post-production, production, mm -hmm. than I was in controlling data. Because the interface at the time, especially, was about moving analog signals, mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. transmitting data. So I'm an old school guy in that sense, where I'm coming from signals, not from uh, digital data. Then I guess the first computer I owned uh, was in the 1980s. Uh, there was an obsolete machine now, which at the time uh, it was something called a uh, Mindset. Mm -hmm. And this was a PC DOS graphic specific machine that had a video analog genlock thing that let you do simple 8 bit animation mm -hmm. and superimpose that on, on video. Yeah? And uh, that's what I actually owned at one time. Uh, it had a very limited capacity. It was incredibly slow and tedious to use. Uh, and the next thing I had was a Macintosh, uh, like a, the SE, you know, this uh, classic uh, white, black and white version with the little screen built in, mainly doing word processing, and Amiga. Mm -hmm. So end of the 80s, the beginning of 90s, then I got into Amiga, especially because I was doing video and graphics. And that was something I could have at home mm -hmm. and work on as opposed to the highly specialized machines that I would use in the expensive post-production television related studios. The biggest issue in creating art, you know, technology and computers enable individuals or artists mm -hmm. to have a means of production. And as Moore's Law evolved and as the processors became less expensive and more powerful, the capabilities for example, what I would need to go into a $2 million editing suite to accomplish, I could to some degree accomplish on my desktop. Mm -hmm. And that lowered the barrier for the means of production in a very substantial way where you could do something of relatively high production value at a reasonable cost and own the means of production. But the problem always was, and it's what we face going into the future with the consolidation of control over distribution ownership of content and distribution was once we have this means of production, how do we get it out when we produce? And as a video artist, you know, in the 80s and early 90s, it was always a matter of, okay, you produce something and what was your audience? How did it go out? The chances of getting something uh, experimental or maybe politically uh, outside the mainstream onto television was always the barrier. And what I saw coming down the road, that the internet was the convergence mm -hmm. of the means of production and the means of distribution, and also down the road, the future of television. Mm -hmm. Well, when I looked at what the possibilities were, there were opportunities in the mid-90s. Uh, at the time, when the web first came about, for me, mm -hmm. it was very primitive. You know, at best, a very slow display of a still mm -hmm. image. This was in stark contrast to the level I was working on in video. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, even a simple page of text information with an image, the ability to have mm -hmm. global or nearly, you know, wired world mm -hmm. distribution of this information mm -hmm. without the gatekeepers mm -hmm. was intriguing to me. So the question was, as the internet scales, as the data pipes become more consumed with basically television, the inversion of the net, I saw this as a doom in the future, that the edge, the intelligence of the network being at the edge was being re-inverted, the many-to-many -many model 
for example, that Howard Rheingold wrote about that allowed the internet to grow and the establishment of virtual communities was being inverted and was being sucked in back to a centralized model of control. And once the old media corporations got their hands on the internet and perverted its potential from being a decentralized many-to-many peer-to-peer network back to a centralized one, I saw that the danger was the internet was going to turn into cable TV where content from the edge would not necessarily reach everybody at the other edge. Mm -hmm. So in 1995, as I saw the internet transition from a research academic network where commercial use was actually forbidden by the acceptable use policy, mm -hmm. commercialization of the internet also posed a threat to independent development, mm -hmm. content and production distribution, especially mm -hmm. distribution. Mm -hmm. So the answer to that was the premise was the only way to assure the existence and the uh, universal distribution of independent non-corporate non-commercial art mm -hmm. content cultural content was to be able to buy the bandwidth mm -hmm. because unlike the broadcasting spectrum which is regulated in this country at least, and, and the concept of the global commons, the airwaves, the electromagnetic frequency spectrum being public resource mm -hmm. like the oceans. The internet in its physical infrastructure is privately corporately owned. Mm -hmm. So the question was how to establish some kind of public space or public access and assure that in a non-commercial cultural way in this climate of uh, in this privately owned world, how to create commercial space, I mean, how to, I'm sorry, how to create public space mm -hmm. in a commercially owned world. So the first thing that came to my mind was what are the means of access? And one of the most essential components, at least in the legacy internet technology as it is, is the domain name. Mm -hmm. And the domain name is to the internet Mm -hmm. what a frequency, like a radio station or TV station mm -hmm. frequency is to analog broadcasting. And so in order to find the content, one needs to have a domain. Mm -hmm. Not only in terms of defining the content, but also enabling the access mm -hmm. to the content. So what I saw was an opportunity, because the limitation of the domain system to country code dot de or you know dot fr or dot com dot org or dot net was an artificial limitation it was not a technical limitation so in 1995 1996 I read the specifications I read the RFCs of the domain system on the internet and understood that it was possible in fact a technically trivial matter to create instead of dot com dot art or dot sucks or dot media mm -hmm. And in fact, I did this. And I set up, uh, first of all, in, in the, my residence, uh, a, a network, experimental network with domain servers, running domains like .art, mm -hmm. and maybe about 30 others. Mm -hmm. This I saw as a huge potential because, first of all, at that time, the domain system became commercialized, 1995, 1996, mm -hmm. what was once free to do a domain registration, subsidized by U.S. tax dollars, became a commercial service in which fees were charged. Mm -hmm. So I saw that not only this was a perfect model economically and in terms of enabling access mm -hmm. to non-commercial and cultural content, if top-level domains were established and independently operated. Mm -hmm. Now, because the Internet is unregulated, and there is, of course, strong support, especially in this country, and across political boundaries, but especially in the uh, Republican and neoliberal mm -hmm. s uh, spectrum, uh, for free market activity. This seemed to be a perfect opportunity to mm -hmm. use that structure in a very positive way under a corporate strategy. And by that, what I mean was it's very easy to set up dot art, dot music, dot mm -hmm. politics, dot sucks. Mm -hmm. But to get it universally recognized, 
was a matter of being included in the root domain. Mm -hmm. So the question at the time was, who controls the root domain? Is there an authority? And what are the terms to determine the access to the root domain? So after doing some research, it was discovered that the private contractor, at the time Network Solutions, who was owned by mm -hmm. SAIC, or Science Applications mm -hmm. International Corporation, were the private company who were the gatekeepers. Mm -hmm. They had, from our research, in a way, the buck stopped there. So on uh, March 11th, 1997, mm -hmm. I wrote a letter to Network Solutions announcing to them that my company, at the time uh, we were incorporated as PG Media Incorporated, at the time, anyway, uh, doing business as name, namespace, name dot space. Uh, we wrote, I wrote a letter to Network Solutions announcing that we were their competitors. <laughs> and we uh, publish and operate uh, several hundred at the time top level domains <laughs> uh, that we requested be included in the root domain database, the root zone file, so that the rest of the internet could access them equally as they could dot com, mm -hmm. etc. The next day, we got a phone call from Network Solutions. And in fact, if you want the audio to that, I'd be happy mm -hmm. to provide you with this, because this is a documented record. Got a telephone call from Network Solutions uh, head of business and their outside general counsel in response to our letter. And basically, what they said was, uh, we're not, we do what we're told, is what they told us. And uh, they said, that we do what John Postel tells us to do, what the IANA tells us to do. John Postel was the one man behind the IANA, or the Internet Assigned Numbers Agency. Mm -hmm. And uh, IANA produced IANA, like a Diana without the D. <laughs> okay. um, so John Postel, Network Solutions said that they do what John Postel and IANA tell them to do. And when questioned further, if they had a written contract that established that chain of command, they said no. So basically, as it stood, Network Solutions was holding the bag. Network Solutions was the sole gatekeeper who, according to their contract with the National Science Foundation, had the discretionary power to make updates to the address system as necessary to keep up with mm -hmm. the times. Mm -hmm. I don't remember the exact language of that section in the original cooperative agreement, but that mm -hmm. at the time was the case. So essentially, by saying no, Network Solutions, in our view, violated the antitrust laws. Mm -hmm. And so our response was not to just say, oh, well, thanks uh, anyway, guys. You know? Our response was to follow that refusal, denial of access mm -hmm. to the essential facility with an antitrust lawsuit, a federal antitrust lawsuit. So on March 20th, 1997, Namespace versus Network Solutions was begun. And that was a, filed in the Southern District Court of New York, mm -hmm. uh, modeled after the lawsuit, the successful lawsuit, mm -hmm. of MCI versus AT&T, which, mm -hmm. in a sense, was, it was the same. It was the mm -hmm. same issue, except we were not asking for access to the physical switch. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm in the MCI versus AT&T, we were asking access to the soft switch, you know, to the, the mm -hmm. root zone. The Court of Appeals found in our case in the year 2000 that the allegations of antitrust in any other case would apply except this one, mm -hmm. in which case they gave Network Solutions immunity from antitrust prosecution mm -hmm. in order to let the U.S. Department of Commerce who had actually taken over the contract from the National Science Foundation and rewrote it, putting in Amendment 11, which stated, clearly articulated the chain of command that was missing when we first sued, to let the Department of Commerce allow ICANN to decide. And ICANN was created two years after we started our lawsuit mm -hmm. with Network Solutions. So somehow midstream, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The government intervened in the case. We joined them as a defendant on First Amendment grounds, and they tried to derail us, basically, mm -hmm. which they successfully ended up doing. They mm -hmm. derailed us.
they derailed us by, I guess, convincing the court to make a political decision. Mm -hmm. Because if you read the Court of Appeals decision in our case, it didn't say that the immunity was given for any statutory grounds. It was a, a conduct-based immunity. It was a special formulation in this case to allow Network Solutions to have immunity mm -hmm. to route around the antitrust law, mm -hmm. to let the government make a policy decision. So the court's decision was not based on statute, because had it been, we would have prevailed mm -hmm. as MCI beat ATT. Mm -hmm. But instead, they found in favor of Network Solutions for policy reasons. There are three common myths about the Internet. That is that the Internet is public, that it has no borders, and that it has no center. These are all false. The Internet is not public because it's privately owned infrastructure in an unregulated environment. The Internet is not borderless, although it appears that we can communicate transparently across continents. Mm -hmm. But in fact, borders are built into the protocol. In fact, what makes the Internet able to exchange traffic is a protocol called Border Gateway Protocol, or BGP, Border mm -hmm. Gateway Protocol. And every switch, every router where a network interconnects with another one is a border. And the firewalls are the customs police that decide which packets can pass or not. So it's a very selective and very controlled process. Mm -hmm. And if you look at a map of the Internet, it, in my description, is a loose confederation of corporate nation states who control private infrastructure. And they exchange the traffic only because they agree to, not because they're required to. So therefore, at each corporate boundary, at each corporate firewall that of, the, of the network mm -hmm. backbone providers is a border. Mm -hmm. The third myth is that there is no center. There is a center, at least as it is in operation today, and that's the root domain. Mm -hmm. The root domain is a center of the internet which is essential to routing or directing mm -hmm. traffic based on the use of the domain name system. And this essential facility the root server, the A root server, because it's set up in a hierarchical delegation of authority in a master-slave relationship. Sounds like colonialism somehow. <laughs> hierarchical delegation of authority is a military model. Centralized command and control is a military model. So the fact that people have a perception that the internet has no center and has no borders is only that. It's a perception. It's not a reality. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the centralized command and control through the root domain is a way of soft switching traffic on and off. For example, the root file, root zone file. Mm -hmm. The root zone file is a text, text file, ASCII text. To make an entry of a domain or to delete an entry of the domain is a matter of text editing. You could do it with no technical experience. The fact that the company or the entities that control that have very, very strong ties to the U.S. government. They're basically Pentagon contractors or SAIC, for example, who owned Network Solutions at the time of the inception of the namespace lawsuit, mm -hmm. was basically their board of directors. If you were to enter one of their board meetings, you would may make the mistaken impression that you've entered the retirement club of the National Security Agency, mm -hmm. the Pentagon, the CIA, etc because their board of directors contained the former chiefs of the CIA, the NSA, the FBI, or other government agencies, uh, generals, you know, people like uh, Melvin Laird, who was the Secretary of Defense during the Vietnam War, or Bobby Ray Inman, who was the Chief of Naval Intelligence, while George Bush Sr. was the head of the CIA. Donald Hicks, Robert Gates, former head of the CIA. These were basically the ones who were in control of the Internet. So SAIC, if you were to look at their corporate profile, their largest customers, now they're a private company, privately held. So there's no public disclosure of their finances or anything else because they're not traded on the stock market. Their largest clients are the National Security Agency, the Pentagon, 
and the IRS and a handful of other like large corporation Bechtel or something like this. Uh, so what does that tell you? Is that we have basically the private spooks with their hand on the control point of the internet. Now it's not only a matter of control because if you understand operation of root and top level domain servers it's also, in my opinion, potentially a key technical point for the functioning of Echelon. Echelon being the so-called global surveillance system. Because what it enables you to do if you were to watch the traffic queries on a root domain server or a top level domain server, mm -hmm. you see high level traffic transaction for every email message, every web hit that's done virtually all over the internet. So that's a high level way you can get a behavioral snapshot of who's talking to whom. Yes. Well, put it this way, one can't discount that this is the possibility, understand? I mean, look, we, we had uh, George Orwell wrote about things like this. We know about ideas of surveillance and control. Whether or not it was designed from the beginning, I don't know. You should ask Professor Wiener that question. I really can't speak for them or answer for them. All I know is what is the result, how it functions, and the extraordinary means to which the government and the corporations went to keep control, to stop that control from moving to the edge or becoming decentralized. Now, the namespace model was about enabling or transitioning the domain system to the edge, making it peer-to-peer, -peer, mm -hmm. not making it a centralized command and control model, making the global function one of interdependence and equal responsibility. And this I saw ultimately as a kind of a digital realm of technical implementation of a democracy by technical means. Because it requires agreement and cooperation on a technical scale. And in fact, the whole idea of the Internet Engineering Task Force or the people who were really energetic in making the net work is this idea of consensus. Mm -hmm. Not authoritarianism, but consensus. And the, uh, the whole idea is rough consensus and running code. I'm sure probably everybody you interviewed used that line. Mm -hmm. But when it really comes down to it, mm -hmm. there's not this consensus because it's ultimately in the hands of who controls the corporate infrastructure of the net. And this where it interfaces with the government. So the namespace model is meant to decentralize and create a peer situation, not a command and control situation. Mm -hmm. yeah? And this has a great implication for local autonomy and global cooperation. Mm -hmm. So this is the whole question that we have faced now, for example, with globalization. Mm -hmm. you know, if you look at the internet as a kind of digital media globalization, okay, and the fact that it's not governed by our Constitution, like, for example, in the United States. There's no First Amendment protection per se on the Internet because where the government is not involved in restricting speech, there's no protection. There's no constitutional mm -hmm. protection. When your governance is a corporate contract that you sign with AOL, Time Warner, mm -hmm. or Microsoft, their First Amendment right is protected against you, you see? Mm -hmm. You're not protected as an individual. You don't have any rights. Your rights are only that as a consumer, you see? So we're not be becoming citizens anymore. We're not netizens anymore. We're consumers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the point behind namespace ultimately then is about autonomy and self-determination, ultimately leading to a democracy of the digital commons, which today is lacking and is totally threatened as the consolidation of corporate control over media and the shutting off, the filibustering, the discrediting, the censoring of independent voices through economic warfare, basically, by crushing them economically, predatory pricing, a violation of antitrust laws, mm -hmm. uh, you know, denial of access. Uh, these are the functions that are happening now that threaten not only the namespace project from reaching its final conclusion, which is universal recognition of our mm -hmm. domains, an autonomous control and a decentralized mm -hmm. uh, localized database mm -hmm. system, but in general. And unfortunately, people don't understand this because as even people who we know and respect 
don't use computers and are dismissive or don't understand this. They think it's a new model that's foreign from political or social systems. It's not. This is corporate fascism. Basically, the future of the internet going along the lines of the World Trade Organization and corporate globalization is corporate fascism. And there's a threat not only to media democracy, but to democracy. We become consumers. We're not citizens anymore. We lose our rights where our local law and our local protection in the real world, not only in the digital world, but one reflects the other, is being replaced by corporate contracts. Mm -hmm. That's what we're threatened by. And so a simple thing like signing up for WTO.sucks or I think uh, Reverend Billy is going to do Starbucks.sucks <clears throat> would actually create a wave of digital democracy that can extend not only the means to communicate that but to support this mm -hmm. autonomous infrastructure. Yeah? This means you think a digi digital future is coming. No, the digital future is here. Is not, not for all of us. But the corporate fascism. Not for, no, it's, not for all of us. Not, not for all of us, but it's established enough that the ripple effect mm -hmm. will take place over the next two to three decades. As any impact of the advent of radio, advent of television, the whole idea of you know, the American consumer model, why people in Europe felt threatened by the American consumer model, yet at the same time we're very intoxicated by it, very seduced mm -hmm. by that. And in fact, I remember when I first went to Europe in the 80s that the televisions were state. The telecommunications infrastructure were state-run. Mm -hmm. Then became slowly privatized. There's still, of course, some state-run TV, which to a point was a good thing. But now, in a sense, even though the way government goes now, I prefer not to have government in my life, or as little as possible. I also don't prefer to have corporations in my life either, because this whole concept of corporate governance, where the glo corporate globalization overwhelms or replaces, supplants our local sovereignty and our local law, mm -hmm. this, is a, this is a threat. So, we have to find some kind of a balance where the citizen matters, where we are citizens and where we're not consumers. And mm -hmm. I think the only way that we can do this at this point is that the citizens have to recognize each other, that they have power, and to mm -hmm. find a way to con consolidate that. And to do this through networks, because the first means of communicate look, truth is the first casualty of war. Mm -hmm. People's perception of truth is shaped by the media. Why the term of art in information warfare is perception management. Mm -hmm. You know, it's this very military corporate mm -hmm. thing, if you think about it, management. And managing perception, well, advertising is information warfare. The way we perceive the news, the way events are presented to us, is from a very military corporate point of view. You know, when Dan Rather broke down and cried on television on David Letterman and said, oh, well, our dear leader, W. Bush, I'll do whatever you want me to do. He proclaimed his complicity to this mm -hmm. kind of strangled hold over the media that the government and corporate structures are putting. And basically, they're, they're seducing the public mm -hmm. into this fame and sensation, you know, coming from Andy Warhol, everything, everybody will have their 15 minutes of fame. What I say is, and what we need to do is, look, you can forget about 15 minutes of fame. What about five minutes of truth? <laughs>